Greetings, students. Thank you for joining us today for the informational session on the Peace Corps experience and the overall applications process. My name is Karen Orr, and I am the Program Director of the Master of Arts degree in NGO Management and the Certificate in Nonprofit Management here at Johns Hopkins University. Today, we will hear from one of our recently retired adjunct professors of the NGO Management Program, Chick Dambach. Chick has taught with the program for the past eight years, and he's worked with the Peace Corps in numerous capacities since he was a uh, first a volunteer in 1967. Today, Chick serves as the chair of the Peace Corps Connect to the Future Initiative of the Association and is the president emeritus of the National Peace Corps Association. Chick has also served as an executive director and CEO at numerous nonprofits and as a former Nobel Peace Prize nominee. Chick will be followed by our guest Peace Corps recruiter, Ms. Michelle Cheatham, who will speak about the volunteer experience, answer questions about service, and provide tips on the applications process. We will then end with a Q&A session. At the end, you'll be chatting your questions. And both speakers will also discuss professional opportunities for return Peace Corps volunteers. Thank you both for joining us today. And Chick, please take it away. Well, thank you, Karen, and a uh, pleasure to join all of you today. Uh, always, always, always happy to talk about the Peace Corps. Uh, my experience was uh, long ago, over 50 years ago, and, but it, it remains to this day one of the most significant and important and meaningful parts of my entire life, and I still reflect on it all the time and, and take great pleasure in, in having served as a volunteer. Uh, just comments from the perspective of someone who served, and, and by the way, even though my service was uh, five decades ago, I, I see currently serving and recently returned volunteers all the time, and uh, I, I'm always struck by the similarity between my experience and theirs. So uh, what you hear from me applies today just as much as it did uh, 50 years ago. I put my Peace Corps experience into... Uh, four categories. Uh, first is recruitment. Uh, second is the training. The third is the service. And the, the fourth is what happens after we serve in the Peace Corps. So just a few words about each of those phases of the Peace Corps experience. In terms of recruitment, uh, when I went in back in the 1960s, the Peace Corps was new and, and ex exciting. It was on everybody's mind. I don't think there's anybody I went to school with who didn't at least think about the possibility of joining the Peace Corps. I don't think it's that much uh, a factor today. It, it's gotta become routine uh, as, as a, a part of our, of our culture, uh, well-established. Back, back when I went in, uh, uh, we really didn't know that much about it or what it would do. Uh, so there was an excitement about it, but I would say uh, it's still exciting today. Uh, the training, uh, used to be all done here in the U.S. And when I went in, it was when they were transitioning from all the training being in the U.S. to it being all of it being in the host country. Uh, I had half of my training here in the U.S., the other half in uh, Bogota, Colombia. I, I served in, in Colombia. Um, the training is intense, um, depending on the country, uh, but much of it is focused on language and culture. A, a, an essential part of the Peace Corps, part of what makes the Peace Corps so important and so valuable is that we become a part of the culture where we serve. We learn the language, we function in their language, not our language, we function in their language. We dance their dances, we sing their songs, we eat their food. And part of training is getting acclimated to that and uh, accustomed to it. We also get training in whatever functional area we may be working in, but an awfully, awfully important part of it is, is learning and becoming acclimated to the uh, people and cultures that we're going to be living with and, and working with. By the way, I think one of the things that, that distinguishes the Peace Corps is from virtually every other program, missionaries go overseas to basically convert the people to 
whatever religion it may be, uh, State Department, USAID tends to go in with the perspective that we're we're bringing something and offering you something and, and giving you something. Uh, and what we want in return is friendship and support. With regard to the Peace Corps, we go in to uh, as co-equal with the people we are living with and serving with in the Peace Corps. Uh, we don't consider ourselves to be superior. In fact, one of the one of the things that we're uh, focusing on in our uh, Peace Corps Connect to the Future is to make sure that the Peace Corps is not in any way viewed as going out to save the world. We don't save the world. We become a part of the world. It's tremendously important to understand that and build that into the, the whole mindset of, of Peace Corps involvement and C Peace Corps service. Yes, we in the United States have something to, to offer the rest of the world, but the rest of the world has an awful lot to offer us as well. And we go in with the attitude that uh, we're there to share an experience, build friendships, hopefully lasting, uh, lasting friendships to, to serve, serve us our entire lives. Uh, I was in Colombia, South America, uh, in a fishing village on the outskirts of Cartagena. You may know that Cartagena is this lovely uh, uh, coastal town or coastal city. But I, I lived and worked among fishermen. And if nothing else, I learned a wonderful skill of how to throw a cast net. <laughs> uh, not that I've ever thrown a cast net since then, but I did learn how to do it. And this picture is of me throwing a cast net that was on the, the uh, cover of the uh, Peace Corps Columbia newspaper. Um, but uh, I worked with, this is a, a village of, of what they call an invasion barrio, people who had moved from the countryside to the outskirts of, a, of the city on land that nobody wanted, virtually worthless land. And uh, they were trying to eke out a living. So I was a community development volunteer, uh, helped organize a fishing co-op. The fishermen were using dynamite to catch fish. It was destroying the fish and the fishermen. So we organized a co-op so that they could get loans and they'd get uh, better boats and get motors and better nets and improve their fishing so that they wouldn't have to resort to using dynamite. We also built a school. And it's important that, that uh, they built the school. I didn't build the school. I was a catalyst to help them get the confidence that they could do it. And with that, they built the school themselves with their own resources. And uh, we were informed by the, uh, the, the government that if the community built the school, the government would provide teachers. And sure enough, the community built the school and the government provided teachers. We're tremendously proud of that. Uh, everybody in the village was illiterate when I arrived, not every single person. By the time I left in the head of the school, at least the young kids were starting to learn how to read and write and, and develop the kind of skills that they would need to, to live and function in an urban environment. So that's the kind of thing that, that I got to do as a Peace Corps volunteer. Others are, are, are teachers, are environmental workers, agriculture, uh, uh, just a, a full range of, of services that, uh, that Michelle will be able to tell you about, but a uh, wide range of things that people in the Peace Corps are able to do. Uh, but the thing I like to focus on more than anything else is what it does after we serve in the Peace Corps, and I refer to it as a lifetime of service. You know, we serve in the Peace Corps for two years, some for three, some for as many as four, but, and we do extremely important work during that time. But we come home from that experience with the knowledge and the values that we develop as Peace Corps volunteers, and it enables us to carry, carry on with our lives doing, doing meaningful work. Not everybody ends up in the nonprofit sector or teaching. Some people go into business and, and other uh, for-profit things, and, and they do very, very well. I like to think the Peace Corps is being a special place for the film industry because three of the most successful people in the film industry all served in the Peace Corps. Uh, uh, Reed Hastings, the owner of Netflix, was a Peace Corps volunteer. My friend Gordon Radley, uh, president of, of, uh, of Lucas Films, was a Peace Corps volunteer. Taylor Hackford, one of the most successful film directors ever, was a Peace Corps volunteer. So the, the point being, of course, that, that uh, service in the Peace Corps doesn't limit us to uh, nonprofit service or to teaching 
the rest of our lives, but many of us do go into that. As for myself, I, I came back, uh, did, did a number of things, but ended up uh, uh, working with uh, the, the National Peace Corps Association, uh, Operation Respect, uh, the Alliance for Peace Building, organizations like that. Served a couple of years as, a, as chief of staff for a member of Congress, John Garamendi, who's also a Peace Corps volunteer. Probably the most significant things that John, the thing that John and I were able to do, if we go on to the next slide, the uh, Ethiopian Eritrea slide, uh, John served in Ethiopia and war broke out between Ethiopia and Eritrea about 20 years ago. And he was concerned about it, gave me a call and said, we've got to do something about the war. And we were able to work with the leaders of the country, the president of Eritrea, the prime minister of Ethiopia, worked directly with them these returned Peace Corps volunteers. We weren't getting paid, but, and, and we had no official standing, but they respected us and trusted us because of our Peace Corps service, and we were given credit for bringing about the end to that border war. We're invited to Algiers for the treaty signing ceremony. And my, my favorite part of it is the picture on the lower right is of a street vendor in Washington. Her name is, is Yeshu. And when we came back from the treaty signing ceremony, I went and got, bought a hot dog from her. We had never actually met before. I bought them before, but we'd never actually talked. I said, you know, I, I asked where she was from. She said she was from Eritrea. And I said, I, I thought so. I know you're president. I said, I said, and she looked at me like, who are you? I said, I'm Chick Dombach. I said, I know you. I know who you are. You brought peace to my country. We did that because of the Peace Corps, because the leaders knew and respected us as Peace Corps volunteers. We did it because of our Peace Corps experience. And a, a street vendor like Yeshu knew us and cared about us. And Yeshu and I, be, by the way, have become absolute best of friends. I go to her house. She comes to my house. And I tell that story simply that it's illustrative of the kind of thing that, that can happen in the Peace Corps community, in the Peace Corps experience. So the next slide, I'll just finish up uh, indicating that be, because of that, and because of all of these experiences, I was encouraged to write a memoir, which I did. It's called Exhaust the Limits. It covers uh, anti-war activity back in the 60s, uh, working with nonprofits over the years, family development, and so on. But it's mostly about the, the kinds of things that I did in the Peace Corps and the Peace Corps has enabled me to do in the subsequent years. So with that, I'll, I'll wrap up my section of this and look forward to any questions or comments you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Chick. That was a lovely narrative of the impact that Peace Corps has had on your professional experience and career. Um, but it's also a testament to how Peace Corps is a wonderful opportunity for any students who are pursuing um, the master's degree in NGO management or the certificate in nonprofit management and how seamless those two sectors are when merging and using those skills within the field. So next we will hear from Michelle Cheatham. She's the Peace Corps Regional Recruiter for Baltimore and the DC area. And Michelle, please take it away. Yeah, thank you. Yes, my name is Michelle and I am the regional recruiter here based in Washington, D.C. It was a pleasure to hear about your experience, Chick. That was great. Um, and it's a great segue for me to talk about some of the more details about Peace Corps that perhaps you don't know and then about the application process. So um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So I'm not only a recruiter, I am also a returned Peace Corps volunteer. I served in the Dominican Republic from um, 2019 until 2020. So I was a part of that evacuated group of volunteers last March, but most volunteers do serve for two years. Um, I had the opportunity to serve in the education sector as a primary Spanish literacy promoter, but I also was able to do some secondary projects where I worked with youth empowerment camps, as well as um, giving some English classes in my community. Go ahead and move on. And so the mission of Peace Corps, I mean, we already heard a little bit about it from um, Chick. He did a great job and I don't want to spend too much time on it, but um, our mission is to promote world peace and friendship. And we do that by um, fulfilling three goals. And that first goal to me is really important is to help the, the people of interested countries in meeting their um, needs of trained men and women. And so the key word is interested. So Peace Corps, we just can't show up to a country and say, hey, we're here to do some work. You know, it's, it's really, um, 
a collaboration, a country reaches out or expresses a need that they have and they reach out to Peace Corps and then they ask for a specific volunteer. For example, they needed um, education volunteers. So that's why I served in the Dominican Republic as a primary literacy um, promoter. I didn't just come saying, this is what I want to do. It's a need that they have and then we're collaborating together with um, the people of that host country. Um, our second goal is to help promote a better understanding of Americans on the part of people served. So really that means you're an ambassador for the United States. Uh, a lot of times um, people in other countries don't have a complete picture of the United States. You know, they see things in media, television, but it's not the complete um, culture of the US. And so you have the opportunity to show and share your own experiences and um, perspectives of US culture with um, your host country. And then our last goal is kind of just the reverse. You have the opportunity to learn about um, the culture and country where you're going to be serving. You're going to help promote a better understanding of them when you return to the US because sometimes you're in a country that you've never heard of or you've never been to. Your family and friends perhaps are never gonna to get to go there. And so you get to kind of be that link between the two and, and share about your time there, your experiences, um, language, culture, customs, your favorite parts and everything. So you get to be an ambassador for them as well. Um, next slide, please. And so to be a Peace Corps volunteer, there are only really two requirements. You must be at least 18 years of age um, and a U.S. citizen. And you can also be a naturalized U.S. citizen. You don't have to be born here to become um, a Peace Corps volunteer. And so though 95% uh, of our volunteers do have an undergraduate degree that is not a requirement, you can always supplement that with five years of full-time professional work experience. And um, you can serve at any time in your life as well. I think it's really important to point that out. Sometimes people think, oh, I'm too old to do Peace Corps or I need to do it right after college. Not the case at all. Our oldest volunteers was 86 years of age and Peace Corps is here for you whenever you're ready for it. Go ahead to the next slide, please. And so this is a brief overlook of what our volunteers do. Chick did mention this. Um, I believe he worked as a community economic development volunteer. I worked as an education volunteer, which is our largest sector. We also do have um, four others. So we have agriculture, um, environment, health, and youth and development. And so um, this all looks a little bit differently, but there are our um, secondary projects. So even if you are going in as an education volunteer like myself, I was able to work um, as well in the youth and development sector with Youth Empowerment Camp. So if your community has um, an interest or a need and you also have maybe a background in that or interest in that type of um, field, you can always bring that on as your secondary project, which I think is great about Peace Corps because you don't have to stick in one little box. You can do a little bit of everything, you know, based off of your community's needs and interests. To the next slide, please. And so, um, Oh, not sure whether that's there twice, but that's just another look of all of our sectors. So we can go ahead to the next slide. And um, this is the overlook of where you can serve. This was a map from a few years ago. Currently, we do not have any volunteers in service due to um, COVID-19, but we are looking for volunteers to return to service later on this year, beginning of 2022. But um, these are a few of the regions where our volunteers serve. The Sub-Saharan um, African region is our most popular uh, region, but we do also have volunteers in Latin America and the Caribbean, um, Eastern Asia, as well as um, the Pacific Islands. And so it's a little bit about myself uh, and my service. And so I mentioned that you can serve in a lot of places. I got to serve um, on the in the Dominican Republic and the Caribbean, nice little island, Hispaniola. And I worked with a team of teachers, which you'll see down on the left-hand side. Um, we worked together to create new and engaging literacy tools and strategies and ways to really get um, kids to be more involved and interested in reading and to also increase the overall literacy rate um, of the children in our school. And so um, kind of what Chick said, we're not really there to save the day. We're not there to you know, show that we know everything. That's really not what Peace Corps does. And so, we came in, we both had ideas, right? And so we kind of put those ideas together to help create something new. So like a catalyst, as Jake I mentioned before. Um, and that's probably one of my favorite parts was just working together and learning things about um, how, they, how they teach there and how they implement different um, strategies and tools because I am interested in literacy. And so that's something that I got to bring back home with me and as I continue to work with literacy in my community. Um, I also was able to work with my my, my superstar um, psychologist there on the bottom right hand side, we 
really put together a lot of materials that she, she calls me today and says, we're still using, you know, this thing that we put together when you were here. And so that's something that's just really encouraging and um, this showing that sustainability that Peace Corps loves to do sustainable work. Not something that's just, you know, go do something for two years and then it dissolves. Our goal is to have something that lasts for a lifetime. Go ahead to the next slide, please. And this is just a little outlook of my, um, my secondary project where I was working with youth empowerment camps. So while I wasn't in the school, I was in my community working with a local uh, nonprofit and we were working to do um, different things with adolescents revolving around self-esteem workshops as well as um, sex ed and awareness, HIV AIDS awareness as well. And so this is a little bit of an outlook. Some of the kids there did attend the school I was in. So that was great to see them outside of school hours. Um, but yeah, just to look at what you can do um, with Peace Corps outside of your primary sector. Go to the next slide, please. And so we talked about where we can go, what you can do, but what are the benefits, right? I mean, Peace Corps has a lot of benefits while you're in service as well as after service, but while you're in service, it's really important to point out that you are receiving a living stipend. I always get this a lot. People are like, I'm a volunteer. Am I just, you know, do I have to pay for this? And you don't have to pay for anything. You're starting from your flight from country, from, from the US to your host country, all of that's paid for, as well as your, um, your housing, your food, your transportation, as well as your entertainment. Um, all that's included in your living stipend. So when you get to country, you are living with a host family, which is really essential for your, your immersion, as well as your, um, acclimation to, to um, the culture in the country. And so um, that's three months typically of your pre-service training and that's with the host family. And then you also have about two to three months once you get to your site where you're also with the host family because now you're in a whole new part of the country and you really need that help to get immersed in your community and just get um, integrated. And so I didn't mention before, but Peace Corps is a 27 month long uh, service commitment. So those first three months are your, your training and then your 24 months is you um, boots on the ground in your community working. And so while you're there, you also have medical and dental coverage, which is really important to point out. So anything that happens medically, all that is covered is great insurance. Honestly, the best insurance I've had to this day. There's no copay. So anything that you need is taken care of by Peace Corps. Um, you're also eligible for student loan deferment if you do have uh, federal loans, as well as cancellation for those who might have Perkins loans. Um, and then I mentioned before, you have um, some money in your stipend for entertainment, which goes into your vacation. And you have incredible vacation time, 48 days. I think that's better than my vacation time. Um, now. So that's something that's really important to point out that you can use that time to do whatever it is you would like to do. You could, you know, perhaps visit another volunteer in a different part of the country, or you could, you know, you know, travel to neighboring countries. I didn't have the opportunity because I was on an island, but I know a lot of volunteers are able to travel throughout the continent that they're um, serving. And um, you can also take that time to travel home if that is something that you would like to do. Peace Corps stipend does not cover um, it's not going to be enough for you to pay for a flight home. So that's something to keep in mind. If you know, you know, perhaps you'll have a wedding like I did at home. That was something I thought about before going and had that money saved to go with my vacation time when that time came. To the next slide, please. And so I would love to talk about safety and health, which is something that's really important to Peace Corps while you're serving. Um, it's, it's not possible for you to have a good service if you don't feel safe in your community and if you're not healthy. And so Peace Corps does have a team of um, medical officers that are available for you 24 seven for any medical needs that you may have. Um, you're able to call them, they're able to come to you, you're able to go to them and um, they really look out for you making sure that you are as healthy as possible during your service. And um, we also have a team of security officers, which they really help with um, your community immersion training. And so making sure that you're just um, aware of all the cultures and the customs within the culture that can really help you to be safe. Because sometimes um, it really just comes down to knowing the customs um, that that's that line between being safe and not being safe, because there are just some things that are not normal. And so once you learn about the cultural norms, you can be more safe in your service. Um, but if there is anything that happens during service or you don't feel comfortable, your safety and security team is there to support you. And I also do wanna highlight that we are a US government agency. And so that's just really important because you have that support when it comes to any type of um, natural disasters in the country that you're serving or any type of um, 
maybe political unrest, you do have that, the, the government support behind you. For example, when I was serving in the Dominican Republic, there was um, a hurricane, there's hurricane season, things can get a little, uh, a little shaky with that. And so there was a hurricane, but Peace Corps was really great about communicating with us when that hurricane was coming. And then also being able to consolidate us because our side of the island where I was serving was gonna be impacted. And so just making sure that we were moved to a safe space and also coming to COVID-19, something that was you know, a surprise for everyone and knowing other friends who work with different nonprofits or different um, volunteer abroad programs, they really weren't able to receive the same support that we were when it came to Peace Corps being able to, you know, evacuate us swiftly and, you know, efficiently and also with funds when we returned home because, you know, we came home as a surprise with nothing. And so Peace Corps was really great about making sure that we were supported um, while we were transitioning back home. And so that definitely brings me to my next slide um, about the benefits after service. And so, um, you know, you're coming back home and Peace Corps really wants to make sure that you're able to transition smoothly and you are given um, $10,000 more or less, um, depending on the time, of transition funds to really help you get acclimated again. Because sometimes people have sold their homes or they've sold their cars or they, you know, they've ended leases. And so these funds are really there to help you to, you know, get, you know, get ready to, you know, get started again in um, U.S. society. So for myself, I was able to, you know, purchase a car. And then for other people, they like to vacation, which couldn't happen recently. But I know a lot of people love to, you know, take this time to vacation before maybe starting a job or going into grad school, which definitely leads us to our next point, which are the grad school benefits. Uh, we do have our Coverdell Fellowship Program where you are eligible to attend over um, 100 different partner universities. You have 200 different programs and Peace Corps is able to provide you with 25% to um, sometimes even full 100% um, of your grad school cost through our Coverdell program. And so that is a lifetime benefit. I love to point that out because you don't have to use it immediately. I have not used it yet, but I definitely plan to use it in the future. Um, you can use it as many times as you like as well. So you could do one program, you know, and excel in that and then decide a few years later, I actually have an interest in something else. And if Peace Corps has that, that partnership, you can apply and then also use Coverdell for that as well. So it's a super great benefit um, to keep in mind if you're looking to pursue you know, another higher education degree. Uh, another benefit is our federal employment advantages, so our non-competitive eligibility for those who are interested in um, working with the government. Maybe you're interested in working with the State Department or working with USAID. You do have that non-competitive eligibility, which really helps you to, to really already be in the, in the pool of applicants kind of above applying at large. And so um, you're applying as if you're already in the federal government, which is a great advantage because for myself after college, I did you know try applying to federal jobs and nothing happened, not a thing. And so after returning from service, I applied for several federal jobs and got a lot of responses and a lot of job offers. And I think just being able to be a part of that um, above that large pool of applicants really helped me out. And um, it's really just great to see Peace Corps on your resume for things that do pertain to um, working with our foreign service or with USAID, those are just, they can kind of see that you already have that passion for service and it really does give you, you know, that leg up. Um, and another benefit is just public service loan forgiveness. So your time in Peace Corps, those two years does count to work toward um, public service loan forgiveness if you do have student loans. Go ahead and switch to the next slide, please. And so now we've talked about all the great benefits, what Peace Corps volunteers do, where they go, and now you're probably like, how do I become a volunteer? And so this is an outlook at our process. And so I really just wanna highlight steps one through three right now, just because Peace Corps volunteers are not in service. So I don't wanna you know, take up too much time going through the, the remaining um, four or five steps because those come after the interview. And so the first step is for you to go to our website and just you know browse our current openings see what you're possibly interested in you know we have six different sectors you can see different programs in different um, positions that are available that might meet you know or align with your interests and then after you may have honed in on one you can apply and so our application process is pretty swift 
But um, there are two components that can take a little bit of time and that is the resume and motivation statement. So your resume is like a federal resume. So it can be two to three pages long, just really detailing your experience, all of your experience, volunteer experience, professional experience, education experience, all those are super important on your resume. And then your motivation statement is just you expressing why Peace Corps? Because there are a lot of you know, volunteer programs, a lot of service programs. So Peace Corps wants to know why you specifically want to do Peace Corps. They wanna know how you're going to deal with challenges because as Chick mentioned earlier, you know, training in Peace Corps can be intense. Being abroad in, in another country for 27 months can be, you know, it can be intense as well. And so Peace Corps wants to know how you're able to you know, handle difficulties and challenges and um, how you'll be able to transition that into a Peace Corps service. And so after you fill out your application, you will fill out a health history form. And so that just kind of gives Peace Corps an idea of, you know, your health background, because sometimes there are countries that you can't serve, you know, due to maybe a medical history. If you have, for instance, like a peanut allergy, Peace Corps probably won't send you to a country like Thailand, something like that. That way, we just kind of have an idea of where, we, where it will be safe for you to serve. And so the remaining steps are interview, invitation, medical, legal clearance, your onboarding, and then your departure. And so that, those are the remaining steps. We're not going to go too much into that today. And so this is an outlook of our website. As I mentioned, um, due to COVID, things are a little bit more general. We don't have a lot of specific um, details. As of before, it would say, you know, business advising volunteer in maybe Mozambique, but right now it says Africa. So it's more general because we're not sure which country exactly will be ready for us um, to return to. And so let's kind of give you an, a broad idea of where you could be serving in terms of region as well as your project. Next slide, please. And so this is the timeline. Right now, the timeline looks a little bit different than usual. Typically, it takes about nine to 12 months from the time you apply to the time you're actually on the plane leaving for service. And so um, right now it's looking about, about 12 to 16 months due to COVID-19. But as I mentioned earlier, we are looking to send volunteers back into service starting at the end of this year, leading into the beginning of 2022. And so I definitely wanna take this time to encourage you to reach out to a recruiter if you are interested in applying because 55% of our applicants who use a recruiter are more likely to become volunteers. We know what um, placement specialists are looking for when they're doing interviews, when they're looking at resumes. And so it's really important to reach out to a recruiter because they have a lot of insight. And so um, if you're interested in doing that, I definitely encourage you to reach out to myself. My contact information is on the next slide. Feel free to email me or, you know, Give me a call if you're interested in being a volunteer or you just want to learn maybe some more details or you have some questions that perhaps we don't get to today. So um, that is all for me. Thank you all for your time. If you have any questions, any questions at all, feel free to um, ask them. Thank you, Michelle and Chick, both for presenting today. I do just want to say from the perspective of a employer, um, Peace Corps really does stand out on a, on a CV. Um, I used to manage a fellowship program, an international fellowship program. It was only for three months, but um, it was also for graduate students and just people really thrived working abroad and working with communities directly. And it was also a very opportune time for them to see if this is something that they wanted to pursue professionally. So um, having recently graduated from a master's degree or going into the Peace Corps prior to pursuing a master's, it does give you that um, does give you that time to, to work in a hands-on capacity and see where you want to um, fit yourself within the future. So Eric is asking, I am interested in a country director position. What can you tell me about the process and requirements? I served in Samoa between 83 and 85. Michelle, I'm fairly certain that question is directed to you, whether or not you can answer it. That's a bit above me um, in terms of country director. Um, I can't really tell you too much about that except for looking on USA Jobs. That is where we post our, um, our job openings. We do have a few right now for director of recruit recruitment as well as um, a chief position, but nothing specifically towards country director, but that would be something you would see on USA Jobs. Um, all of our postings are there. I also just want to say, Eric, um, USA Jobs has a very illustrative applications process tutorial. So they have videos, they have resume building, um, 
tutorials, they pretty much give you exactly what they're looking for in terms of preparing your application materials and submitting that package. But it is a very lengthy process and it can take up to like one to two years to even be interviewed. So uh, Nicholas asks, hello, thank you for presenting. Do we need to have bilingual abilities? Thank you for attending. Um, there are, there's no need to have bilingual abilities. Peace Corps has an incredible um, language team, like a team of people who train you. You have four hours a day um, for those three months of intense um, language training and immersion. So you don't have to have bilingual abilities, though for our Central and South America programs, um, they do have a requirement of, of two years uh, or two courses of um, a language, of, of Spanish language. So you don't have to be bilingual, but you would have to have previously taken um, two maybe college level courses of Spanish. So um, yeah, don't be bilingual, but you probably will leave bilingual if not close enough. Uh, Mika asks, will the COVID-19 vaccine be required before applying and, uh, and into departure? Also, are there any volunteer terms shorter than two years available? Yeah, sure. So um, there are volunteer opportunities that are shorter than two years available. That is our, um, our Peace Corps response program. And so that is targeted more to, toward um, mid-level career professionals. And so um, it could be working with health or you know teaching, but it is more specific. Um, they look for people who have a master's and maybe in that area and have time and experience working within um, that field that is an option um and in in regard to the COVID-19 vaccine that is going to be required um Peace Corps does already have you know vaccination requirements generally for volunteers and so this is just going to be another one of those vaccination requirements and um but volunteers will be responsible for getting the vaccination um on their own at this time because Peace Corps doesn't have any pull in in um you know choosing people to be vaccinated. They don't have that power right now. So just as a follow-up question, from the time that someone applies to the time that someone's deployed, when is that typically, like what is that time frame typically? Typically it's about nine to 12 months. For example, I applied in the month of May and was accepted in June. And then I didn't leave until March of the, of the fall year. So that is a typical timeline. And in between, in that timeline, um, you're fulfilling your medical and legal clearance, which I had on the slide, but I didn't talk about too much. But um, in that time, you're fulfilling everything that you need to do, excuse me, medically and legally. So that's what that time period is there for as well. Also, um, do you mind talking a little bit about the training? I know that Chick mentioned it, but in terms of the in-country training, did you feel that those skills were applicable elsewhere outside of your Peace Corps service? Most definitely. Um, the language skills for sure, I think are probably the best skills that, not the best, but one of the best skills that you'll receive from um, your Peace Corps training because they are, this, they're the training staff for languages is probably one of the best. And um, I already came in at a high, a high Spanish level, but even throughout the training, I left with even more knowledge. And um, it's also been great to put on your resume because of um, the certification that you'll get for the language that you acquire, as well as just the um, cultural competency. I mean, that's not part of the training, but it is something that comes along with it. And that's something that is valuable anywhere, in my opinion. Yeah, I see a few questions in the chat box. Oh, you can't see the chat box. Yeah. Okay, I'll just read them out. There's a question for Chick. Um, do you think the Peace Corps is still relevant post-COVID? From Absolutely. <laughs> what, what do you think I would say? <laughs> <laughs> of course, it, it's relevant. I think the, uh, the in some ways more relevant than ever in that the, the, the world, the globe is becoming increasingly uh, interconnected, interdependent. And in the post-COVID world, we are still uh, interconnected and interdependent uh, just for, for COVID itself. Uh, you know, the, the vaccine isn't, isn't just for the U.S., it's for the world. Uh, the one that I got, the Pfizer, was indeed developed in, in Germany. It was not developed here. Uh, the world coming together to solve these problems is, is absolutely essential. Environmental problems are, are global. Uh, so we, we, just, we just absolutely must learn to understand and respect other people and other cultures 
and and of course uh, the the technology is is we import technology we export technology uh, all of it is is relevant so as far as I'm concerned the answer is an emphatic yes. <laughs> I also see the questions. Um, okay. Chuka is asking, hi, can you be recruited if you wait two years after you graduate or any time appropriate for you? Yeah, great question. Um, you can apply whenever, you can be recruited whenever. I didn't apply directly after college. It was about almost two years for myself after I graduated um, to when I decided to do service. It's all based off of your personal timeline. Um, for myself to be transparent, I had student loans, and so I really wanted to make sure I had all of that, um, you know, prepared, put together, things paid off so that I could, you know, serve without having to worry about um, outstanding balances at home. And so whenever you're ready to serve, Peace Corps will have you. Thank you. And uh, Hanin asks, thank you for the awesome presentation. Ms. Shayla, can we reach out to you even though we don't live in the D.C. Baltimore area? Do recruiters help with resume prep? Yes, you can most definitely um, reach out to me if you do not live in this area. Um, if you do attend John Hopkins, I am um, the recruiter for that university. But if you do not, and um, I can also put you in contact with the recruiter for your area. So feel free to reach out to me and you can answer any questions. And then, you know, I can definitely put you in contact with a fellow colleague who potentially is a recruiter for your area. And we do help with resume prep. That is a big part of what we do. We look over your resume, we give feedback. We also have um, resume workshops. And so that's, you know, entirely um, for the resume and our, um, also if you cannot attend it, we do have the, the recording of the workshop. So if your schedule doesn't work with what we have, we can just send you that workshop and you can look at it as many times as you like. And then Carmel has a question. If we are interested in serving in a specific country, do you suggest we wait until Peace Corps confirms that that country will be hosting, presumably posted on the website? I had gone through the recruitment process to serve in Georgia as a community economic development volunteer, but had to withdraw my application four weeks before departure and would be, in, be interested in serving there when I reapply. Okay, great question. So typically, you know, we do have the option for you to apply specifically to a country. Right now we do not. So if, if you really do want to um, serve in Georgia, I would, yeah, I would recommend you, you know, wait for that country to be listed. I'm not sure how long, you know, that would, that would take, but also I always have to encourage um, applicants just to be flexible if you can be, just because, um, especially right now with COVID um, and this reopening, things are going to be very limited. So um, positions might be limited and, um, so that means that perhaps you want, we might have Georgia open up and you want to be a volunteer in Georgia, but in case that doesn't you know, happen, would you be flexible? Would you be willing to serve in a different country? Um, that's, that is something that Peace Corps would like to know, but um, definitely you can apply for a specific country and feel free to wait if that's what you would like to do. And then Eric has another question. How soon does Peace Corps expect to restart programs and reopen country offices? Yeah, great question. Um, we are looking to reopen, to re to restart in um, later this year in the fall and or winter of 2021 um, into early 2022. Excellent. And Carmela saying, thank you, Michelle and Chick, as well as Honey. Oh, sure. and Micah has another question. What factors, red flags would impact acceptance as a Peace Corps volunteer? Great question. Red flags. Um, Honestly, <laughs> red flags will really probably be in your um, in your motivation statement potentially or in your interview. Um, Peace Corps is really look, looking for for people who have um, you know a desire to serve and a desire to um, you know learn about another culture. If red flags could be um, lack of uh, cultural sensitivity or um, this idea of maybe save, you know, the savior complex or a superiority complex of, you know, we're, I'm coming here to help these, these poor people. I've, I've seen some things in these, in these statements and resumes are just like, wow, you know, um, you, you really want to stray away from any um, cultural insensitivity. That's going to be a huge red flag because we are going to, um, to learn about a culture. We're not really coming in to be, you know, the, the know-all, the superior um, culture, you know, that's not what we're doing. And so um, 
yeah, hopefully that's not the kind of person you are because, you know, yes, you can always mask that in an interview or, or, or motivation statement, but um, hopefully that's not where someone's coming from. But um, sometimes we do have that language in our vocabulary that we don't even realize it's there. So maybe that's not even your heart, but that could be um, just, you know, sometimes environment is what you've been hearing and, and that could come out in a statement or, or interview. So making sure that you keep that um, in check and making sure just really watching your vocabulary language revolving around serving um, in another country. Yeah. Um, just quickly, Michelle, in the training, is there kind of that cross-cultural sensitivity training for anyone who's new to, to international travel or working abroad? Definitely, definitely, yes. There is that, um, that, there is that training that is a facet of our training. Um, just, you know, living with the host family, that, that's just a, really a big part of it. But then also Peace Corps does have um, just sessions, just talking about, you know, cultural differences, because there are those and you want to make sure, you know, you're maneuvering those, you know, properly and respectfully. And so um, that is a facet of training. But Peace Corps is already looking for people who are maybe already open. You know, we're not looking for people who already have, you know, preset um, ideas, you know, mindsets. We're not trying to, you know, change you or you know, trying to help you maybe grow so we can't change the heart but yeah and then eric has one last question um how is peace corps handling overseas staff five-year commitments interrupted by the pandemic so i don't really have any information about how peace corps handles um staff abroad that's definitely above my my position um but i know that they are still working. I'm not sure how they're handling the five-year commitment. I do know that extensions have been granted for numerous employees, but I can't specifically say um, for those working abroad. And Carmel has another question. Are you able to talk more about the support provided by Peace Corps to return Peace Corps volunteers after they were evacuated due to COVID, immediate and ongoing? Sure. I mean, I can talk about my personal experience since I was an evacuated volunteer. Um, we returned pretty swiftly. We had like a little bit less than 24 hours. Um, Peace Corps was able to supply us with, I mean, funds is probably the most important part. I mean, fortunately for me, I could move back in with my family, but there were those who had nowhere to go. So making sure that we had just money to be able to um, operate. And um, they were also able to provide us with lodging. And so because some people could not, you know, maybe go back with their families because when we first returned due to COVID, all we know is that it was, you know, really highly dangerous for those who are in the 60 plus community, as well as those with pre-existing or, um, you know, different medical backgrounds. And so for myself, my parents are of the 60 plus community, so I couldn't, I know, you know, now I'm home, but at that time it's kind of like, oh, I can't go home. Peace Force, like, yes, don't go home if you have, you know, if you live with people of these, 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 these. And so I was like, so where am I going to go? Um, Peace Corps was able to provide us with lodging. I was able to, you know, stay at a hotel for 14, I think it was 14 days of isolation. And so that was really great that Peace Corps had that in place or I don't know where I would have been, maybe a friend. But um, that is something that's really important to point out as well as um, just the, the job opportunities. Peace Corps was just, I mean, my inbox was full of different webinars, different workshops on, you know, rest preparing your resume, interview, um, interview workshops and everything because they really wanted you to be able to, you know, get a job if that was, you know, the next step for you. Um, yeah, just making sure you have all the tools available as well as our returned Peace Corps volunteer group. It's phenomenal, um, especially being in the DC area. There's just so many return volunteers. People actually opened up their homes for volunteers who were evacuated. So that's a little bit outside of what Peace Corps does, but it is a part of the Peace Corps um, community. And if that does not answer your question, please let me know. I think I hit all the nails. Yeah, I, I, would, I would just add to that, that the, the, that's where the Peace Corps community comes in. The National Peace Corps Association mobilized a remarkable nationwide effort to connect with the, re, the evacuated volunteers to provide uh, contact support whatever uh, was needed. Uh, the, the, the Peace Corps community is a phenomenally and wonderful community to be a part of. And the community really stepped forward to help out in any way they possibly could. How many volunteers have been sent out? Do we have that statistic? Oh, we should over, have our... over the years, the total over the years is, is about 240,000. Wow. Yes, that sounds exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> 
Very impressive. Well, unless we have any other questions, and it looks like Michelle is um, open to taking any questions about the applications process, and if you wanted to reach out to Shik about his experience in terms of transitioning it into a full career, um, those are all available, as well as his book, Exhaust the Limits. Thank you, both of you, Chick and Michelle, for um, joining us today. This was a wonderful presentation. I learned a lot. Um, I'm also a strong advocate of international travel, working with communities, um, and really honing on, on those people-to-people -people ties. So once this COVID-19 pandemic lets up and it's safe to travel and work as a community again, um, I look forward to people having that experience. So thank you so much. Thank and you. Um, I look forward to hearing from all of you. Take care. Thank you all. Thank you.